On behalf of the Hellenic Bankers Association UK, I would like to welcome you who've been here with us this evening at the London School of Economics. This is a joint event between the Hellenic Bank Association and the Hellenic Observatory of the LSE. It forms part of a series of public debates that aim at discussing matters that are relevant to the Greek economy in general. As part of that series, our current um, speaker uh, was also a speaker on Greek economy back in 2012 at another joint event that took place back then. Seven years later, the form of tonight's debate is to look back on lessons learned from the Greek crisis. While we appreciate this is a controversial topic, we aim at having a serious discussion respecting all opinions. After all, this is how a discussion at a university should be. Paul Thompson, as Deputy Director and later as Director of the IMF's European Department, has been involved in the Greek crisis from the outset. Paul has been the Fund's mission chief for many countries, including Greece, Iceland, and Portugal, while he held senior roles for countries such as Romania, Ukraine, and Russia. Kevin Featherstone is the Director of the Hellenic Observatory at the LSE, Eleftherios Venizelos, Professor of Contemporary Greek Studies, as well as a regular contributor to Kathimerini in Greece. Additionally, special thanks to Milpan and Apostolos Kuzinis for their support towards the association and this event. May I kindly remind you that tonight's event will be video and audio recorded. Soon, it can be downloaded as podcast from the website of the Hellenic Observatory. You can share your comments using the Twitter hashtags, LSE Greece and HPA UK. We have agreed that Paul will make an opening presentation. Kevin will then follow up with questions to Paul. And later, you'll be invited to ask questions. Now, over to Paul for his presentation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I'd like uh, to thank Professor Featherstone uh, and uh, the Hellenic Observatory and for the invitation and you all for, for being here. Uh, the 10th year anniversary uh, of, of, of the Greek crisis is coming up, so this is certainly a, a good time to discuss the role of the IMF. Let me just make very briefly a few caveats uh, up front. While uh, my discussion will draw co some conclusions about the challenges ahead, I will not be discussing the new government's economic program. Uh, second, I will be focusing mainly on things that went wrong, on the criticism, uh, 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 ignoring a number of, of, uh, of, of issues, uh, 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 but uh, secondary issues, but this this focus means I will focus on, on things that are negative, and it might give some uh, too negative connot connotation. The fact is that Greece has undertaken uh, many important reforms. We must recognize this, and uh, uh, these reforms have come at a significant hardship to the Greek uh, people. Uh, this is not a comprehensive review. Again, I'll, I'll basically talk a bit about fiscal, fiscal austerity, why was the crisis, uh, the, the economic contraction so deep, and the, the issue of external debt. I will, for instance, not talk about the financial sector. I had to make some choices about what to talk about and not talk about. These are personal views, not the IMF views. Uh, we have several papers that have reviewed the program that you can find on our website. Uh, let me also remind you that the last disbursement of the IMF was back in the middle of 2014. Uh, so for more than half of the time of, or for half of the time of the Greek programs, we were not involved in the sense we had active program, but we were involved in the discussions. So let me start by giving you a brief snapshot of where Greece stands today. Uh, when we uh, designed the program, we realized the fact that Greece has to go through a 
a, a sharp internal devaluation would, uh, would cause a depression and take a, 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 a toll on growth. In terms of per GDP per capita, we assume that it would take Greece, back in 2010, we assume it would take Greece eight years to return to pre-crisis levels. Uh, that, is, that is this one. This was as bad as it had been during the US's great uh, 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 depression, and it was not as bad, uh, it, was, it was much much worse than, than, than the Asian crisis, and uh, 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 that was relatively fresh in memory at that time. So it was a pretty worst case uh, uh, scenario. The outcome has been much worse. Today, almost 10 years later, GDP, GDP per capita is still 22% below pre-crisis level. If we use the European Commission's forecast, it will take until 2031 for Greece to come back to pre-crisis level. If you take the IMF forecast, it actually is, is two or three years longer, another 15 years from, from now. So we clearly have a lot of explanation to do here. Uh, the fiscal adjustment, I will start with the fiscal adjustment. Remember that the euro crisis, uh, let me just, this is pretty much the euro crisis originated in the, not only in Greece, but in the periphery, originated in the mismanagement of the monetary windfall, low interest rate, much easier financing, associated with euro adoption. In Ireland, in Spain, and to some extent in Portugal, this windfall fueled an unsustainable demand boom, almost entirely through private credit channels. In Greece, it took place almost entirely through the fiscal channel, in particular to a huge increase in public pensions, but also in transfers and wages. Pension and social transfers increased by a whopping 7% of GDP from the time of Euro adoption to the eve of the crisis, while the public sector wage bill increased by 3% of GDP. This drove the overall fiscal deficit from 4% of GDP to 15% of GDP, five times the Maastricht limit. Unsurprisingly, therefore, Greece, contrary to the other countries, faced fiscal consolidation on a dramatic larger scale than these other countries. I will get to the debt issue later, but let me stress that with a primary deficit of 12%, the overall was 15, a primary deficit of 12%, 10 to 12%, uh, depending on, on what is, 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 is the base year, that no amount of debt restructuring, whatever we think about the debt, uh, how we handle debt, I'll get to it, no amount of debt restructuring would have prevented Greece to go through traumatic fiscal adjustment. The original program foresaw, uh, I can say no, no, no amount of debt restructuring would have prevented a, a heavy dose of austerity. The original program foresaw fiscal adjustment of more than 12% of GDP over three years. Although not unprecedented, this was ambitious by international comparison and especially of a view of Greece's track record in policy implementation already at that time. But a less ambitious path would have required more financing. Here, remember this, financing in the program was already way, way above anything we had seen in any IMF program for decades. Remember, we were going to the Europeans to ask for that kind of money. We were asking the Europeans who had a no transfer union taboo, who had no bailout in their sort of philosophy, to commit this kind of money to a country that in the Europeans' views had been misleading them on the numbers. There was no political support for providing even more financing at that time. This also meant that when the deeper than expected recession, and I'll get to that, forced significant additional uh, 
forced significant additional measures because there was no financing for a more drawn out adjustment program. And this meant since the low hanging fruits have been sort of picked early on in the program, the quality of the fiscal measures started to deteriorate around 11, 12. Already at that time, we became, the fund, increasingly concerned that the adjustment, while extraordinary in scale, was beginning to be achieved in a gross friendly and unsustainable manner. What do I mean with that? Capital, I mean in particular that capital spending, investments, and essential recurrent spending, other than wages and transfers, have been cut to levels that hamper potential growth and the public sector's ability to provide basic public services. On the revenue side, an increase, so in, on, on the expenditure side, you have this, all the cuts were on the things that are important for growth and the ability to provide public service. On the revenue side, we had an increase in already high tax rate levied on a very narrow base. And this caused a, a dramatic deterioration in an already low co uh, collection of revenues, which fell from 65% in 2010 to about 41% in 2017. The key issue here is, and I think still is, lack of political support for reforms to reduce pensions to sustainable levels and broaden the, uh, uh, the tax base. Let me, here you see uh, a picture of, of uh, transfers to the pension fund in, in Europe. In Europe, the average is two to three percent. In Greece, it was for a long time above 11 percent, and with the 2016 tax reform, it has come down to about 9 percent. The problem is that these reforms, we put them on the book and then they are reversed. The 2016 tax reforms that have produced this decline is, uh, is being reversed in important areas. So the deficit in the pension fund remains extremely high by comparison to other European uh, 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 countries. And I think with the recent cancellations, I have difficult to see it coming down uh, 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 further. And if there are more cancellations, I, I think it will go back up again. As to the personal income tax, I'll show that here. The exemption threshold relative to the average ways is more than two, it's two, two and a half times higher as the European average. This means that well over half, close to 60% of all wage earners in Greece are exempt from the personal income tax taxation. That again, as you can see, is dramatically higher than the European average, which is around 20 or something like that. Here again, the reform that we had agreed in 2016 would have brought about uh, a, a lowering, I don't know if you can see it, you can probably see it because this, uh, uh, a lowering of the tax uh, 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 from about uh, a lowering to below 50% uh, to sort of becoming uh, at the higher end of Europe, but not an extreme outlier. That reform has also been canceled as soon as the pro uh, period of program was over, the government canceled this reform. Fundamentally, Greece is still providing levels of pensions comparable to the richer European countries without the same level of European middle class taxation that you see normally in Europe. Without pension and personal income tax reform, it would be very uh, difficult to undertake growth friendly spending and tax reform. We think that it's critical for long-term growth that Greece have these tax and pension reform, not to run higher surpluses, I stress that, but to find the resources for to invest and to provide better uh, basic services and to lower taxes in a, in a, in a where they are clearly distortionary and, 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 and hamper economic growth. I will gonna end with, uh, on fiscal with uh, a comment on public perceptions of our role. 
we have often been wrongly accused, including by the Greek authorities, of advocating more austerity. This has caused some frustration with the I within the IMF already from 2012, when we belatedly, and that I'll get to too, argued for lower surpluses. The Greek actors actually back then had a tendency to side with the Europeans on higher surpluses. I understand it's because they wanted to impress uh, uh, European countries about the Greek resolve to deal with the, with, with the problem. Our frustration was much larger in recent years when our call for pension and tax reforms, difficult pension and tax reform, to make room for spending on growth-friendly measures was portrayed as a call for more austerity. Actually, the government deliberately overperformed relative to its ambitious target of 3.5% that it agreed with the European in order to show to the European they didn't need to do these difficult tax and pension reforms. So it took more gross damaging austerity than advocated by the Europeans in order to avoid the growth-friendly reforms advocated by the fund. Okay, uh, this is all a bit technical. Let's, uh, let me turn to the reasons for the deeper than expected output contraction. And I'll start with a technical concept, but then uh, 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 move on from there. We, I agree, uh, it's often said that we initially underestimate the fiscal multipliers and therefore the impact of the fiscal consolidation on GDP. I agree that I think we estimated it somewhat, but the quarterly program reviews relatively, we do these programs reviewed every quarter and relatively quickly allowed us uh, to acknowledge that, to, in, to change the multipliers, to have slower fiscal adjustment and more money in the program, argue for more money in the program. I, of course, agree that to the extent that these, the need to, uh, to have these downward revisions, they, that might have contributed to the dissolution and fatigue that started becoming evident. In that sense, our underestimation of the multiplier might have contributed to the deepening crisis that soon began to take a, a, a toll on confidence and economic performance. But the root, case, or root cause of this crisis lies much deeper and cannot simply be explained by underestimates of multipliers or other design issues. What do I mean? Contrary, contrary to the other uh, crisis-hit countries, there was a fundamental lack of broad political support for the program from the outset. From the outset, the program was opposed by the main opposition party and also soon by the old guard within the ruling party. By the end of 2011, European leaders had lost confidence in an exasperation, finally broke the exit taboo, telling the main parties to unify the behind the program or accept the consequences. The Papademos and Samaras government that followed did unify behind the program, but the political fragmentation uh, uh, continued, leading to the virtual collapse uh, for the traditional parties that culminated in the coming into a, a office of, the, uh, of Syriza in 2015. Doubts about support for Greece's European partners, doubts about support coming from, uh, uh, from Greece's European partners undoubtedly made things worse. And this is important. We cannot just blame the Greek political system. While Europe had shown considerable polit political commitment to Greece by admitting it to the Euro in 2000, uh, there was actually those who argued, rightly or wrongly, I'm not taking a view on that, there were those who argued that this was a case of politics overriding economics. Uh, 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 what was clear was that there was evidently much less political support uh, uh, by, by 2010. This the wavering support and broader concern about euro area architecture caused growing doubts at that time about Greece's ability to avoid uh, Grexit. From early 2011, each time the quarterly reviews of the program uh, came there, we had to inter internalize a constant deterioration in sentiments as the developing political crisis in Greece and the steadily more vocal skepticism in Europe continuously fed on each other and made things 
worse. Each time we came there, sentiments had gone further, further, further south. Let me uh, uh, show you charts here. Economics is to a large extent about sentiments. This shows interest rates, and the other one here show uh, 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 the uh, investments. In investment is in uh, on, on on the right, and uh, 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 bank deposits on uh, on 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 on. on uh, on the, on the left, measured to the left. What you see is that bank deposit halved and investment essentially declined. Economics is about confidence. Confidence collapsed, and how can we be surprised about that there is a collapse of output? It's well beyond the issue of the right uh, 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 multiplier. An interesting comparison is here with the 2011 program which I also negotiated, by the way, with many of the same team uh, that we did it in Greece, and that in important ways were structured along the same lines as the Greek program, including the same multipliers. Ob although there obviously were differences because the issues were not entirely the same. When I negotiated the, uh, the, uh, the, the Portuguese program with the government, had at the same time parallel discussion with the main opposition party with the understanding of the government, the government knew that. So when the program was approved, it had broad political support of the main uh, 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 parties. A few months later, there was a change of government and implementation of the program continued seamlessly without any, any conflict, uh, with full political support in the, in the Portuguese body politic for the program. Also, you never heard people abroad talking about Portugal exiting the euro, as you, uh, as, you, uh, as, as you heard in Greece. I think that this whole political crisis, to me, is the key issues. Fundamentally, I would argue that the Greek crisis was as much, if not more, a political than an economic crisis. The reasons are complex going well beyond the scope of this presentation and my expertise. Uh, but the weakness of the Greek political system and its economic policy-making institution and the power of Western interest could surely not have come as a surprise to veteran European policymakers. Nor should the plans, no, no, uh, uh, nor, nor should the flaws in the architecture have come as a surprise to European policymakers. Thus, saying that the Greek crisis was as much a political as an economic crisis does certainly not relieve policymakers like myself uh, from, the, from the responsibility of the malaise that follows. It is entirely legitimate to ask uh, if, uh, if, we should, if, if we were not too sanguine about the Greek political system's ability to implement a program that would require fiscal adjustment of more than more than 10% uh, of 12% of, uh, of GDP over a short period, instigate a significant internal devaluation, and take on deeply entrenched vested interests opposed to reforms. In ret retrospect, I surely think that we were too optimistic. For instance, the initial assumption in, in our debt sustainability analysis, the DSA, uh, that Greece could reach a primary surplus of 5 to 6%, which would bring the debt down fast. Uh, that assumption, you could, there are examples of that, and one could, one, could, one could justify it, but that, but the fact is that that proved far too optimistic in the Greek reality. The same goes for assumptions like privatization proceeds of 50 billion. That too proved too optimistic in the Greek reality. Such, op such optimistic assumption made us admittedly initially underestimate the debt problem. I think one area that I think is particularly troublesome is uh, that our too optimistic assumption about reforms made us not only overestimate the economy's supply response, but it resulted in an excessive burden placed on labor seriously contributing to a sense of unfairness and attendant loss of support for the program. 
Thus, the fund, the fund was rightly the fund was rightly supportive of the 20, 2012 labor market reforms. We advocated them, no doubt about that. And I believe that the reform of collective bargaining to better align wages and productivity at the enterprise level and the lowering of Greece's exceptionally high minimum uh, wages uh, was necessary to improve competitiveness. The problem was, however, that the program were much less successful in opening up markets for goods and services. Contrary to labor markets, reforms of closed profession and the opening up of the economy involve a huge number of small changes with some multiplied difficulties in overcoming the resistance from vested interests. So this is what happened to prices. We, there was very little decline in prices. The whole burden fell on a, uh, uh, on, a, uh, on, a on, 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 on wages. Uh, the burden of the internal devaluation clearly fell too much on labor. Thus, I am saying to you, yes, we definitely got some important things wrong, initially wrong because we misjudged support for the program in Greece and abroad. But the program was gradually modified in the context of quarterly reviews. The DSA's assumptions became much more realistic and large-scale debt, debt, large debt relief was relatedly provided. I'll get to that in a moment. And as, as mentioned, Greece was given more time to undertake fiscal consolidation while European partners accepted to provide support on a truly exceptional scale, ultimately reaching 140% of GDP in order to fit the Greek reality. Greece was given more time, but at the same time, Greece had to persevere with continued painful fiscal adjustment. Such a situation, such a dynamic is not uncommon to IMF program. We work under extreme uncertainty, not least polit political, in circumstances constantly involved. Program will must be uh, sort of organically adjusted to changing, uh, 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 to changing realities. The bottom line is that Greece and its European partners endured in the end, doing what was needed after several iterations to keep Greece in the euro area. Finally, let me comment on the debt issue. We have often been criticized for having supported a bailout back in 2010, rather than bailing in creditors, banks, and the argument is that we, that left an, an unsustainable Greece with an unsustainable debt burden. Now remember, back in 2010, this was 18 months after Lima, financial system globally was still reeling from the global crisis. Most important, there were no firewalls to prevent contagion to other vulnerable euro area countries. The European had built this system with no ability, if there was a crisis in one country, to prevent it spilling over from the other countries. Remember too, coming from the front, we have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the member, in this case Greece, but we also have a, a, a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the membership. Systemic consideration will always be part of how we think. Back in 2010, systemic consideration weighted heavily on the, on, on such concerns loomed Lots in 2010. Uh, okay, now, when the bail in on private creditors, we call it the PSI, public sector, uh, uh, a private sector initiative, finally came in early 2012, it was tough by any comparison. Uh, here you show. Uh, uh, one axis shows the size of the haircut, and, and the other say the restructured debt in percent of GDP. The Greek PSI broke records when it finally came in 2012. That was a tough uh, 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 a PSI. You could argue this would be even tougher, but this would greatly have risk, 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 the risk of holdout litigation and spillovers. That was basically done in a largely voluntary way by then 
By then, banks, uh, creditors realized that there was no way around that. But even tougher terms, uh, that, that might have caused significant litigation. Would it have made a major difference if this PSI had come already at the outset? All other things equal, we calculate that uh, uh, it would have reduced debt by 18% of GDP. You might say this is not large difference given that debt to GDP actually peaked at 180%. But all other things are, of course, not equal. The lower debt in 2010 would have enabled a somewhat limited easing of fiscal policy. More important, I think, it would presumably have had a positive impact on sentiments by lessening, lessening the sense of unfairness and loss of public support caused by the bailout of foreign creditors. Surely, if we have had an ESM and a, a ECB, what they call OMT, back in 2010, to, to stem the contagion, to prevent the contagion, surely that would have been desirable to get that upfront adjustment, even if it was a limit. The more controversial issue on debt, however, is with respect to what we call OSI, official sector involvement. Because by, by then, with a deep output contraction, it soon became clear that the PSI alone would not be sufficient, and that official uh, sector involvement, or fix, official sector debt relief, would also be required. As you might know, the controversy here is that Greece's European partners insisted on avoiding nominal haircuts, and instead of providing debt relief by reducing the net present value of their claims through large reduction in interest rates and lengthening of maturities. We would have preferred haircut, but we accepted back in 2012 that the provision of this debt relief through these NPV reducing measures, lower interest rate lengthening uh, 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 maturities, would provide a meaningful economic alternative. I will show you this, this chart here. The dramatic lengthening of maturities and reduction in interest rate produced a significant easing of the, uh, of the, of the debt burden. Uh, it gave Greece essentially AAA interest rates uh, uh, around, uh, of, of around 1.8% and eventually the best maturity profile of any advanced country in the world. It's, uh, uh, as, as, you can, as you can see, at interest payments fell from 12 billion before the crisis in 2009 to 6 billion by, uh, uh, I think, 2015 already, been more or less constant uh, since then, taking interest payments much below other highly indebted countries like Spain, Portugal, and Ireland, despite the increase in debt in the meantime. By 2014, markets started seeing that this might actually work, and, and, and Greece regained some access to capital markets. The European had promised back in 2012 that they would give more debt relief if the situation didn't improve. By the end of 2014, people started telling me, and my colleagues started telling me, the Europeans might not have to give more debt relief because this might be working. But as you know, the situation is here rapidly again when, uh, when the new government abandoned a large part of the program in early 12, causing a further contraction output and triggering uh, this, uh, the, the, the second uh, Brexit crisis. Project, pro debt to GDP projections shot up and significant ad additional debt relief became necessary. We were involved in these discussions. We again said that we you know, prefer a haircut, but we can work through these further lengthening of maturities and reduction in interest rates. Now, the point was at that time, interest rates were already at the ESM financing cost. So there's not much you can do. Only thing you can do is you can lengthen maturities. But maturities were already some of the best in the world. So we were talking about maturities that would take Greece well, well, well beyond on what was considered maximum maturity. Now, this was in the midst of a situation with deep animosities between Greece and some of their European partners. And the fact is that there was simply no political support for our economic argument that we have very long maturities. So in the end, uh, 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 Europe decided to go ahead without the IMF uh, uh, 
And uh, 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 as I said, we were not involved in program uh, since then. We are, what is the situation? I am still, I am still concerned that somewhere down the road, when this mountain of debt that now sits on the public balance sheets has a sort of transition to market back to private balance sheet, that the market might not want to do that, take that on at an interest rate consistent with debt sustainability. I don't know, but that's our concern. Clearly what the Europeans have put on the table have improved that situation significantly in the, in the medium term. But we have this question about the long run. We're not sure, but there's uncertainty about the long run. This being said, I do recognize that the debt sustainability issue might not be as a serious concern as it once was. The fact is that the Europeans have, at the end of two serious episodes of Brexit fears, ended up showing extraordinary commitment to Greece. And Greece has shown an equally extraordinary commitment to do whatever it takes to unlock this European support. I can understand if potential investors out there are not too, con too concerned about the debt sustainability at this issue. Looking back, what would I conclude? What would I do different? I do think that uh, the 2010 bailout was justified by systemic concerns. I've often said I would do the same again. People don't like that, but the same uncertainty, same world situation, I think we'll do the same again. But in retrospect, this entailed a transformation from private to public balance sheet that greatly politicized the debt issue. In view of the downside risk, in view of the doubts we had at that time about you know, the risks of the program, I do think one could argue that we should have sought a commitment by creditors to stand ready to give debt relief if such uh, risk materialized uh, uh, in the, in the form of haircut. We did not. We did not. The issue was not uh, 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 no, uh, raised. But the point is, we did not foresee the degree to which the escalating crisis between Greece and its European partners would politicize the debt issue. OK, I think it's time to conclude. Very briefly, I've already spoken so long. Sorry about that. Uh, contrary to other main reserve currency. The euro area is not a political union. And that is what you need to remember. When a Greek minister rightly complains to colleagues from other sovereign countries in the Eurogroup about painful cuts to pension and minimum wages, sympathy will in the end be tempered by the fact that many of the ministers around the table pay even lower pension than, than uh, Greece does. When a Greek minister appeals for better financing terms, Many of them will remark, well, we, all, we actually pay higher interest than you do. When I come to the Eurogroup and argue that, uh, that the primary surplus should not be more than 1.5%, I will be reminded that other countries in the room are supposed to run higher surpluses. In the end, the Eurogroup has to strike political compromises, and sometimes these compromises are difficult to reconcile with the IMF's rule-based system and our need to apply unified standards across the membership. In the early years of the crisis, when there were acute systemic risk, it was easier for the fund to work within the limits arising from these special features of the euro area. But as such risks have subsided, this clearly proved more difficult. So where are we? After many iterations uh, involving political, difficult, political brave decisions by both Greece and its European partners, Greece has achieved a considerable measure of macroeconomic stability. A modest recovery is on the way. Unemployment is declining. Real wages are beginning to recover. Sovereign yields are much lower. And capital market access is slowly being restored. But pervasive rigidities uh, still weigh on growth. And as I noted in the out, at the outset, uh, you know, it's going to take long for Greece still uh, to return to pre-crisis level. What we essentially have is that Greece, through this program, through the macroeconomic financial stability, has gotten the breathing room that it needs to start undertaking some of these more fundamental structural reform, particularly the opening up of the economy to more competition that is needed for Greece to prosper in the Eurozone in the long run. I'm going to stop here, and I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Thank you for listening.
the director of the Institute. Well, thank you for that. You've obviously covered uh, quite a lot of the um, agenda and a number of the uh, important issues. I'm going to try to follow up and um, question you on a number of the points that you uh, raised, and then we'll be opening it up to contributions from the audience. Perhaps I could simply start with a brief historical uh, question. In 2010, when the IMF decided to um, engage in the bailout uh, with the Europeans, there were many in the IMF who said no, many opposed it, um, individual departments, members of the uh, executive board uh, opposed it. You had to change your debt sustainability rules in order to uh, allow the IMF to uh, participate. So I wonder why uh, the IMF took that major decision to join in the bailouts. And of course, there are some who suggest that the reason why the IMF decided to participate was the systemic risk aspect that you mentioned. In other words, to put it more succinctly, the I IMF became involved in order to rescue French and German banks rather than rescuing Greece. So I... Uh, uh Good question. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are an institution that deals with sovereign risk uh, problem. When countries lose market access, uh, uh, we are there to be sure that these things don't spread and destabilize the whole system. I know there were people that, uh, 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 that objected but nobody could seriously expect the IMF to sit on the sideline when the mother of all sovereign problems all suddenly popped up inside a, Euro and a currency union of advanced countries with major vulnerabilities to other places in the periphery. Of the, no, there was never any doubt uh, uh, in, in the operational departments and management that we needed to be involved. There was not. To be involved, but what was the primary purpose? Well, uh, you know, if you ask, I mean, clearly, uh, we were concerned about systemic uh, uh, risk. I mean, you, you know, there was something that was, was controversial. We, had a, we actually had some, uh, uh, we have a policy, which you call the exception access policy, yeah. which basically put, not, when we go into these huge, huge, huge amounts, uh, we need to assure our board uh, to protect our own financial position that debt is sustainable with a very high probability. When I came back from Greece, I couldn't do that. I could not say that uh, that was, was, was sustainable with a very, very high probability. So we actually changed our rules to say that we can go in even if that is, is not with a very, very high probability if there are systemic concerns. So systemic concerns were a big part of it, no doubt about that. Okay, okay. It's a... Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's fine. We'll try to go reasonably quickly, so we'd uh, maximize the time for contributions from the uh, audience. One of the themes that you've uh, mentioned is the lack of political ownership, uh, comparing Greece and uh, Portugal. Uh, but it strikes me that we're comparing an apple and an orange in the sense that uh, Portugal had a heavy shower, Greece had a deluge of, of rain, uh, just, I hope this sound is uh, okay. But it's, it, it, you take the point that uh, you criticize Greece for lack of political ownership of reforms, but the contrast with Portugal is that you were asking far more of Greece. The, the challenge for Greece was far more than for, for Portugal. So I, I accept that the program, I mean, the, the problem was different, both in terms of scale, yeah. but also in sort of, you know, uh, some of the details. I, you know, I do think that we have on the one hand Spain, Ireland as a crisis was mainly private, entirely banking, private sector, uh, uh, private private uh, 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 sector fueled uh, uh, credit. Uh, uh, Ireland had a program, Spain handled it without program uh, with the fund. Uh, uh, in the other end, we had we had we had Greece with a. Uh, you know, uh, huge fiscal deficit, and Portugal was somewhere in between. Uh, yeah. I I, uh, I agree with that. Uh, uh, fiscal problem was surely not at the same magnitude. Uh, 
on the, on the structural side, actually, Portugal have had any, even more anemic growth than, than Greece mm. before the crisis. So the structural problem was certainly there. Uh, I also think that the, you know, uh, 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 the, the problem in the banking system was not as, as, as uh, acute at that time in, in, in Greece. The Greek problem was never originating in, in, in the, in the, the banking system. But you know, I, could also, I also did the program with Iceland a year before. Again, a, 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 a unique degree of political consensus behind the program. So yes, the program might be different, but it is, it is not surprising. If you have a program and soon we descend into a situation where there's a major battle at the political level. We should not be surprised that out in the, you know, in the enterprise that need to do reform, that vested interest resists reforms. Because they really think, well, we just need to hold out. Right? Yeah. So, okay. You, you used the phrase about the quality of uh, reforms when you were uh, speaking. And as I've said uh, privately, I uh, agree very much with the uh, need for serious structural reform over the long term. One of the things which I would have difficulty appreciating is some of the targets which were set for specific reform. And from the area that I might know a little bit more about, if we think in terms of uh, the reform of the public sector, the reform of the public administration, I guess it would be a kind of uh, Greek politics 101 to say that Greece needs reform of the state institutions, Greece needs reform of the public sector. You could have said that 30 years ago, you could have said it yesterday. It's a regular point. In the second memorandum, however, the second bailout, which you were involved in, one of the targets which was set was that Greece should um, shed 150,000 public sector posts in a relatively short time period. I forget, but from memory, possibly less than two years or something. A very, a very short time period in any event. 150,000 in the context of Greece is a huge uh, figure. Now, to me, that seems to be incredibly clumsy. And um, I hear people saying that this specific emphasis, this specific reform, was something that you insisted on. Well, so could I could I just say <laughs> before it's a serious uh, discussion. I'm not trying to mm -hmm. uh, be dramatic. It's a serious uh, discussion. We can all agree structural reform, but it's sometimes can appear clumsy. Why would I say the figure of 150,000 can seem clumsy? Perhaps for three reasons. One that the, the figure was not arrived at on the basis of any kind of assessment of the need of public administration. There was no consultancy assessment to say how many civil servants with what skills and where does Greece need. It was a budget fix, 150,000. We could have uh, fixed a budget with presumably 300,000. It's a, almost an arbitrary uh, figure. But domestically, it strikes me that it delegitimizes reform. How can a domestic politician in Greece advocate serious structural reform if there's a, a figure like this, which seems to be clumsy, which is very difficult to rationalize, very difficult to support, but in the context where there's very little welfare support, if you're gonna make 150,000 people unemployed, this is seriously bad news to manifold uh, circles of, of the Greek uh, population. But it strikes me that it's the delegitimization of reform which seems to suggest that whilst there are many reforms needed, this one seems to be incredibly clumsy and self-defeating. So I, uh, I will dispute the facts. Okay. Uh, uh, I think there were hardly any uh, mandatory layoffs in the public sector in Greece. But the target? It's uh, it, the, so the first program uh, and the main main reduction that came was through attrition. Yeah. So there was a rule that for uh, you can rehire one of every five, I think, or one of every three. True, but, but that's in the uh, that's in the sense of what happened rather than the setting of the. That was the instrument. The instrument was through attrition, and uh, there was 
also a discussion in the second program of mandatory, but the numbers were dramatically less. I think uh, 15,000 or something. So I, I don't agree with the number of 150. I cannot remember the exact number. It was much less than that, and it did not happen. It's a, and, uh, I, but I think, I think you raise an, a, a very important point, and that is, uh, no, and if there's one thing I, I, have, I have learned the hard way after decades in the IMF, is that these kind of reforms have to come from inside. You cannot, yeah, you cannot come just because a country desperately needs your money to start you know, forcing this and that structural change in the economy. It has to come from, uh, from inside because otherwise it's not going to stick. Otherwise it's not going to stick. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I think this is particularly important for, for, for all these sort of opening up of closed profession, which are hundreds, thousands of small things. There is no way that you can sort of enforce that. Uh, uh, so I, I, I agree with your, I think it's the, the basic point that credibility has to come from inside, come from something that is uh, yeah. homegrown and in a realistic manner. We can all agree with that, but then um, you know, critics would say the credibility also has to come from the from the targets. And if I remember correctly, the one hundred and fifty thousand figure was there. Well, we'll have to go back and check. We can go, we can go back. Um, I'm sorry whether this is feedback. I'm not quite sure, but. Um, you uh, make comparisons, of course, and um, when I was looking at the uh, the internet, it takes uh, only a few minutes to come along to the WikiLeaks April the 2016 um, conversation that you had about the IMF involvement. And of course, the then mission chief, your successor as mission chief for Greece on behalf of the IMF, was recorded as uh, saying something to the effect of they never do what they say. And you've just alluded to that now, uh, that they don't deliver the promises, that easy talk, uh, but no action. When you think in terms of the period that you've been involved in from the very beginning, I don't know, with uh, many different governments, many different ministers, were they all equally bad in reform? <laughs> In, in Greece, yes. Or, or, or couldn't you have chosen one to say, that's the one we're going to um, help more? Uh, well, I need to be very careful now. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> to help you, I, I, uh, I say this, of course, as a Brit uh, with our imperial history. We understand divide and rule. <laughs> it's... Uh, I, uh, I mean, first of all, I, you know, I... You understand? I, I have I will not comment on on people who who uh, who, who uh, tap into my cell phone and whatever said that this yes. is uh, uh, what, what was said in that that phone conversation uh, between me and my mission chief. Uh, but uh, on the, no, I do think, and I'll answer it from the positive side. I do think that history will say uh, that uh, uh, no the. The Pasok government uh, 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 took some very courageous decisions uh, uh, about reform, about labor market reform. And uh, 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 you know, some people will ask me that this paid a price for it. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I do think that, that, that uh, 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 you know, Papa Constantino and the, and the people around him. Uh, uh, in, uh, in 10 and 11, took some very, very difficult decisions that involved saying no to their own constituencies. And uh, 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 I think that needs to be right now. Last Friday, the IMF did its annual assessment uh, for Greece. And in one of the uh, statements it made was that uh, the most important structural reform transformation lies ahead. In other words, uh, the biggest reform challenge is the future rather than the, uh, the recent past. And you've referred to vested interests, uh, etc. 
I know you don't wish to talk about the specific governments at the moment, but uh, given your involvement from the beginning, is this a, a system that can actually produce serious, sustained reform in your mind? I, I know that you want more re reform. Everyone would say we want more reform. But you, are you optimistic that the system, the system can produce the reform rather than any individual prime minister or minister? Yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, I, I, as you know, the prime we worked with the prime minister in the, who was in the previous government, and I have no doubt that he understands the issues. That's uh, no doubt about that. Uh, it it is we we know that it is going to be very very difficult. Uh, there is really fierce entrenched resistance when you come out to uh, opening up the uh, profession. We can see how difficult it is with pension reforms, and I I understand that. I mean, in a nutshell, you have. A country that, to a number of mistakes, end up giving basic pensions that are close to German levels in euro terms, but that cannot inflate relative to Germany. It's the currency union with them. So you have this increase of on the expenditure side of 10% of GDP, where you increase wages, pension, other social transfers. In nominal terms, they go up and up and up. But you cannot rely on inflation to erode them because you're in a currency union with, well, with Germany and other countries. It's very, very, very difficult to solve this problem, problem without nominal reduction. And that is, uh, uh, you know, there are not many countries in the world uh, that can do that. It's a very, very uh, difficult uh, uh, problem. We have sort of, Greece now have a, a, a breathing space uh, uh, but it means, and it has longer to do it, but I think it's absolutely critical that one start dealing with the, with the problem of pension and the, and the tax system. That is why I think one should start. Greece need not in order to have higher primary surpluses or repay debt faster, but for Greece to start investing, for Greece in, in the public sector infrastructure, to Greece provide basic public service, for Greece to lower some of the bizarrely high uh, uh, tax rates to level where the economy, you know, uh, where people are willing to pay taxes. And uh, 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 I think that it's difficult for me to see the modernization of the Greek economy if we, if, if in the public sector, you sort of pay, have this very Northern European enti entitlement without the Northern European taxation as well. And it's very difficult for me to see that. But I think that's where one should start. But then we'll also start need to liberalizing the economy and opening up. It does not need to be done overnight. We just need to steadily uh, work, work. Okay. Well, last question from me. Um, one of the comments you made on several occasions was that uh, if the same conditions occurred, you'd do it all again. On the debt uh, bailout. Yeah. On the debt, the debt uh, bailout. I just wonder when you think in terms of the period from 2010, away from the specifics of the Greek case, of course, there's quite a, a, a spread of opinion, the debate about the relationship between the IMF and the European Union for this kind of activity. Um, I thought that was a, a very bold statement to make. I don't thought that in the future, there'd be many in the IMF saying that on the basis of this experience of the uh, several bailouts in the Eurozone, we step aside, uh, we, don't, we don't get involved. And I wonder whether your comment is more specific. Your own independent evaluation office in the uh, IMF, the European Court of Auditors in the EU, uh, the, vol the both sides have had the assessment, self-assessments of what went wrong. I take it that you're accepting that some of those uh, comments in some of those report, reports yeah, absolutely. Uh, were correct. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of recalibration right. rather than simply saying that uh, we do the same thing all again. No, I, I was talking specifically about if you have a case where uh, a, a bail uh, in, a bail -in will, will spread to the system fast, then I, as an IMF official, have to think about the consequence. We are not in such a situation anymore. 
No, for the euro, the eurozone now, the euro area has a strong crisis uh, prevention mechanism in the ESM. Yeah. It has in the ECB's uh, OMT an ability of the of of of, of the ECB uh, to provide support. So this is totally speculative on my part. It's a, I don't. This is not gonna 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 happen again inside the euro. I, I'm just saying, need to understand that. Uh, uh, no, we need to think about the system. Okay. That's, that was my point. What the IMF? I have no idea what the IMF would uh, would do if they have uh, you now a, a future uh, uh, issue inside the eurozone. That would be well after I have retired. So leave that to the future generation. Okay, uh, it's uh, no idea about that. Let's take the opportunity then to invite uh, some questions. If you could just put up your hand and say who you are, and just in the interest of time, if you can please make the question rather than. Uh, rather than uh, a speech, we have uh, a number of people. Can we take the lady in the centre here, please? Keep your hand up, so you, we know the it's, the microphone's coming from behind you. Uh, if we can take a group of yeah, three, yeah. so, uh, please. Uh, hi, thank you very much, Mr. Thompson, for your question. Could you speak up, please? I have. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is more forward-looking. Um, so your program has a primary surplus target for Greece. And the IMF came out on Friday and said that it should be lower mm. than the current 3.5%. My question to you is, in your opinion, what should that percentage be? What is my opinion? What, what, what should the, the primary should surplus be? target be, okay. if not 3.5%? Many thanks. Can we take the uh, gentleman at the, the very back, and then we'll come to the questions on the back here. So if you could put up your hand again. There's a microphone coming. Yes, hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask about 2015 and uh, June, actually, when um, the ECB, along with the IMF, decided to uh, end the implementation of uh, the emergency liquidity assistance for Greece. And I'm pretty sure that the IMF had a say in that situation. Once the uh, money was over and Greece was basically had a lifeline through the ELA, why didn't the IMF interfere? With that decision, why didn't you try to uh, stop uh, the ECB from uh, cutting the LA during one of the most biggest crises in the history of the country? Thank you. Okay. And then there were two questions at the very back. If we could take both of those, please, and then we'll come back to Paul. Hello, thank you. Yanis Andritsopoulos from Greece's daily newspaper, Tanea. It is often said, and I believe you said it too during your speech, Mr. Thompson, that political instability undermined the Greek programs. But didn't the bailouts, especially the rapid pace of fiscal adjustment, demanded fuel this instability? And what, what was the biggest mistake you've made? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> what was your biggest mistake? I like that. Uh, Jim, Jim, Jim. Uh, Neil Kisley, BBC, and previously European Commission. Uh, you talk quite a lot about um, the quantum of debt that Greece had taken on. And I think you were alluding that although those um, uh, uh, maturities have been extended out for many decades, you know, that was more sustainable for Greece. I think many people would say that the quantum of debt that Greece has taken on over the three programs is vastly more than it could ever repay. Mm -hmm. Now, Debt repayment was always a question that was off the table for the Troika because for political reasons, the EU did not want to entertain the idea. But now we're at the point where there is a new head of the IMF, a new president of the ECB who was formerly at the IMF and had spoken favorably in terms of debt reduction, a new commission and a new chancellor in Germany coming up. Does this mean that we're going to see that question of debt restructuring and reduction revisited? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so on the on the on on the primary surplus, uh, we have we have uh, said for a while we think that uh, uh, it would be uh, you know, once you target a lower primary surplus over the long run, uh, uh, the, that that. That that's well well known. We we uh, we still uh, think so. Uh, we are not in a program. We are not in a program relationship. We are not there to tell the Europeans and uh, and 
and and the Greeks, uh, you know, what you know, uh, what should be done here now? We have said over the over the medium term, uh, we do think that one could target a, a, a lower uh, lower surplus. We stand by that, but this has to be an agreement between Greece and its partners. It's uh, uh, we have let our views be known, but it certainly have to be uh, done in a way. Uh, uh, that it doesn't create any doubt about uh, uh, the Europeans' willingness to stand by Greece in the, in, in the future. So this is a this is for discussion between Greece and and, and its uh, European uh, partners. Uh, you know that on on the uh, on on the ELA, I am uh, uh, no, I am uh, we certainly uh, uh, not in the business of of, of telling the ECB. Uh, uh, what uh, to do? Uh, you know what the issue was. The, the issue was at that time, back in uh, in June uh, 2015, there was the view that there was not a sustainable package on the on the on on, on the table, and uh, uh, that had for all of us uh, to continue uh, to disperse for all of us into a package that is not not sustainable. Uh, none of us would have support. Uh, from our boards, whether it's the ESM, the ECB, the IMF, uh, in, in that situation. Uh, uh, on the on the speed of adjustment, uh, if, if that was uh, one of my original sins, uh, I uh, no, there are many, but uh, uh, I, uh, as I said before, when you wake up one morning, if you have a fiscal surplus, a fiscal deficit of 15% of GDP. It's three, it's five times the Maastricht rate. The IMF goes to the main capital and argue for what is, by any comparison in the whole IMF experience, a scale of support that is multiple about anything we have seen before we say to the country, to, to the to the major European countries, you have to break this taboo on not you know, uh, bailing out uh, uh, countries that is sort of critical for the for the political coherence inside the eurozone, and you have to do it for a country that uh, that now being accused for having uh, uh, you know, uh, not not uh, you know, uh, 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 hidden the real numbers if you want to do. I can tell you that there was no political support for going even slower. The, the period that, that was there was an ambitious one. Again, it was not unprecedented, but it was ambitious, and it certainly proved too ambitious in the Greek reality. And once that reality became clear, we managed after a while to convince the Europeans uh, 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 the we, I mean, the Troika convinced the, uh, the Eurogroup that more money would be needed and slower fiscal adjustment would uh, uh, be, be needed. Uh, debt. Uh, what again was the question on that? Uh, it was uh, looking forward uh, to the future. Do you want to repeat the uh, question very quickly? Do you think the IMF would revisit the debt uh, level? Uh, Necessarily, the IMF, whether the political climate would you know, now be uh, different with new leadership. Greece is under no program anymore. Uh, with us, with the Europeans, uh, uh, there is a strategy on the table. As I said, uh, I can understand why uh, why uh, uh, investors might not be too concerned about it, given that, that Greece and, uh, and, and Europe has shown that they deal uh, with that. As I said, we have some concern about medium-term uh, risk, I can tell you, I think it's critically dependent on growth. It's uh, with these long-term, long, long, long projection period, it makes a huge difference whether Greece grows by half a percentage point more per year or not. So in the end, this depends, in my view, entirely on Greece's ability to reform and, and boost uh, productivity uh, through reforms, uh, uh, so I am not uh, I am uh, I am not saying that I can tell you for sure uh, 
the Greek debt is, is, is unsustainable. I can say that there are some risks and uh, uh, they are linked to issues uh, like growth. There is a, clearly that, that issue is now, uh, 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 as far as all partners are involved, that is, uh, you know, let's get on with, us, with it and then we can, uh, we, we will uh, we'll see. But I think part of the question was also whether you thought there was a political window, an opportunity. No, given I, don't the think changes, any, I don't think it's any given the changes in Germany. I don't think it's any interest to, to raise this issue now. And I think, you know, least of all, the Greeks do not want uh, this issue to be on the table again. They want to start invest, you know, uh, focusing, uh, uh, using uh, limited political capital in Greece and abroad to, uh, you know, to reform the economy. Uh, I assume, I haven't talked to them uh, about it. I, uh, I, I don't think that that, is, that issue uh, should be on the table now. Okay, let's take a, a few more questions. Can we take the gentleman right in the center here, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Paul de Gauer. Um, I would like to come back to the fiscal multipliers. You, you mm. mentioned that uh, the IMF found out after the facts that the fiscal multipliers exceeded one, um, which of course we know that if that is true, austerity will tend to lead to an increase in the debt to GDP ratio because with a fiscal multiplier exceeding one, uh, austerity will have the effect of uh, lowering GDP at a faster rate than lowering the debt. Now, you also said that if you had to do it again, you would do the, say, the same thing. Would you? I mean, given that you now know that the fiscal multipliers under those conditions are larger than one, would you, in the same situation, have advice for the kind of austerity that was done at that time? I think, uh, no, when, I, when I said about I would do the same again, I was talking about the bailout, that was a different issue. Uh, on the design of the program, uh, you know, the fiscal multiplier is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, there is no consensus on what the multiplier is. And I can tell you that most of the most of what I have seen of estimation do not manage to separate the truly ex ante multiplier from this collapse in investments and, and confidence that uh, that it essentially entail a dramatic tightening of financial conditions, uh, uh, which is a separate separate thing that bears down on 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 growth. So uh, I, I I do think that the uh, multiplier is probably a. Uh, Higher, we, we assume 0.5. I, I, uh, we did the same in Portugal, uh, and I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I accept that it's, it is probably uh, higher. I don't know if it's about one. I don't know, and I, uh, you know, I do think it depends critically on uh, on uh, on the credibility of the overall program. It is. Uh, it depends critically on whether the fiscal adjustment is done in a credible way and in, a, in, a, in the context of, of a what comprehensive, is, what coherent credible, program. What does credible mean in that sense? Well, I mean, it's a, you know, if, if, you, uh, if, you have a, if you have a fiscal adjustment that is uh, done on a, you know, in a way that is not based on, let's say, pension reform and tax reform in a durable way, okay. but just across the board cuts uh, okay. that might not stick, uh, if it's not uh, if it is not based on a broad political support, as I said, then I can assure you the reaction and the multipliers will in the end be different. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I mean, there is a, uh, there are clearly people who would, who, who would ask who would argue that uh, uh, if if you have a fiscal fiscal tightening, uh, uh, it might actually have a positive impact on growth if in the right context. I'm not saying that, but it is some people will argue that. Okay, let's go uh, upstairs. There's the gentleman in the blue shirt in the very center. If you wait for the microphone, please. It's being recorded. Uh, the other blue shirt, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Thurgood. Uh, a counterfactual question. What, if, what would the Greek economy look like if it had never joined the euro how many years ago that was? I, I don't get it. What would the Greek economy look like today if it had never joined the uh, euro? 
the UK probably. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, just following up on the on the previous um, question, um, the one before that, actually, uh, you mentioned that the um, uh, incorrect, inaccurate multipliers in your projections were not really the main reason why um, Greece entered this um, uh, larger than expected depression, and the main reason was that the governments uh, wanting to please um, the Europeans were actually taking measures that were very um, unfriendly to growth, i.e. hiking taxes um, horizontally. But then as far as I remember, most of the, um, on the other hand, most of the previous governments would always argue that they had no choice because the creditors uh, wanted to see very fast fiscal adjustment, something that gives results, saving straight away. And they were not patient enough to wait for growth-friendly measures to, to bear fruits later on. Where does the true, tr um, truth lies? Is it mainly the Europeans was there some truth in that, that Greece, I mean, did Greece really have any other choice? Or uh, um, the, the governments were right in saying that the Europeans forced them to, to take those horizontal uh, tax hikes, for example. And what would you do differently um, to convince perhaps the Europeans to take more sensible approach if, if this was happening again today? Th th that's fine. That's, you covered, um, <laughs> I think, everything, actually, in that uh, question. Uh, I'll remind you of the question in a moment. There's a question here. Uh, thank you. I'm Manolis Kalenianos, professor of economics at the University of London. Um, so in the decade before the crisis, Greek exports actually grew very, very fast. They grew at almost the fastest rate uh, in the Eurozone, uh, which stopped completely after the crisis. Well, despite despite reform, despite the large reductions in wages, despite the fact that the domestic market had collapsed, Greek exporters basically stagnated for almost eight years. Now, I was wondering, and, and this has nothing to do with uh, the lack of political credibility of the program or uh, the lack of political ownership of the program. So I was wondering uh, if the program could have been designed in a way, in retrospect, to have uh, shielded that sector of the economy that was crucial for a resumption of growth given the austerity that, as you say, was necessary. Thank you. OK, so the first question was, uh, would Greece be better off if it had never joined the euro? I think that, uh, uh, I mean, the short answer is, is, is no. I think uh, uh, Greece would have faced all the same challenges uh, uh, that it, uh, uh, in terms of structural reforms that it's facing uh, now, all the same challenges uh, adapting to a rapidly changing environment, globalization, uh, uh, overcoming homegrown structural mobility, all the same uh, issues will be on the table. So my answer is, is clearly uh, uh, no. The second question, if I um, may remind you, is um, your criticism uh, has been that a lot of the reforms have been uh, horizontal uh, rather than perhaps setting priorities and being more uh, selective. I think the question was essentially, uh, who is responsible for making the reforms more ho horizontal than, uh, than selective at a time when the creditors, the IMF, the Troika, were uh, pressing for rapid fiscal adjustment? Uh, were you actually giving the time for Greek governments to be selective in their prioritization? I, I, th I think that uh, uh, I think this this is a, this is a good question. You will, if you look at the uh, at the evolution of the of the of the program, I think there was a period uh, where uh, you know, the programs became a bit of a Christmas tree. Each time we had sort of a problem, we sort of put up a new ornament, and the, and there was this proliferation of uh, of uh, of, of structural uh, conditionality. Uh, you will see, uh, uh, you know, if, 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 you, uh, if you look at the, at the in, in the program uh, that was approved in principle but never dispersed because we, ne we, we didn't get an agreement on, on, on that in the end, uh, we are down to, I think, it's five prior actions. Uh, having had multiple, many, many uh, uh, more prior actions uh, uh, relating to structural reform. I think there was a significant streamlining uh, of the program. I think we learned that the hard way that we need to focus on a few essential 
uh, reform. But let me say also, uh, often, and it's, it, I don't want to put the blame on the Greeks, but often, you know, Greek ministers themselves say, ah, it would be a good idea to put this in because I need to generate political support for this and for that. And, and so often there are, you know, there are also sort of domestic constituencies uh, that think it's a good idea to put my issue on the, on, on, on the Christmas tree so that they can get some domestic political support. And that happened over the, the full period? We're not talking about just one particular government? No, I think, it's, I think that, that's general. Uh, I think that's, that's, the, that's general. I think, uh, I think we clearly, uh, uh, I think there was a proliferation of, of structural conditionality in the, in the second program uh, compared to the first. Uh, and then when the, the, you know, the third program, but as I said, never, never dispersed but was negotiated, uh, there was basically a return to basic pension reform, tax reform. That was more or less it as far as we are concerned. Okay. Then there's the question about uh, the export sector and uh, couldn't more have been done to um, prioritize that sector? Well, it's a... Uh, you know, I, it, it, it's a, uh, that is a, a complicated uh, 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 question. It is, uh, 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 the fact is that the private sector bore a lot of the adjustment uh, burden uh, in, in, uh, in Greece. Uh, we haven't talked about the financial sector. There are a lot, lot, of, lot of issues uh, uh, there, credit, uh, 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 dried up. Uh, uh, I uh, uh, and, and the exports sector certainly was was also a, a major victim of this whole collapse of of of, of confidence. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I'm sure if 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 the program had worked overall better, the export sector would also have done that. So I I I, I uh, better. I'm not so sure that I, I could see what one should do in particular to protect the exit. I mean, this, this was about internal devaluation. There was an export. There was a competitiveness gap, Des, despite the strong uh, export performance. And I cannot remember how strong it was. I, uh, you, you say it was strong. I, I, I take your, your word on it. But Greece, by, on, uh, by the time the crisis had, had a competitiveness problem, had a current account problem also. It, so it had a competitiveness problem that needed to be fixed. Uh, and uh, uh, and the internal devaluation was, uh, uh, you know, was 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 aimed at, at fixing uh, that the problem was that confidence collapsed. Right. That's uh, okay. I wonder if I can, with your indulgence, ask the last uh, question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the award-winning film director Costas Gavras uh, is about to release, or it's being released a movie based on the Yanis Varoufakis uh, memoir of uh, Adults in the Room. And it's a dramatization. So various actors are being assigned the different roles in this uh, crisis. When you're in the shower or the bath and you're reflecting on what might be in this movie, who would you like to play your role? <laughs> well, I can... Uh, uh... You know, there was, uh, uh, there was, uh, I think there, there's a, a, a contact uh, in, inside my department where people are guessing who it should be. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I must say that they all are look, uh, they're all people who have specialized in playing villains. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, you know, I, I assume that boring bureaucrats like me uh, will be written out of the script, so I think it's, uh, uh, I, uh, let's leave it at that. Okay. Let me, uh, first of all, thank the Hellenic Bankers Association for their uh, support here. But also, I'd also like to give a very genuine uh, thanks to uh, Paul for coming along uh, to the Hellenic Bankers Association, the Hellenic Observatory, uh, to talk about the history of the Greek crisis and the IMF involvement. I think your presentation has been very uh, direct and very honest, and uh, you've answered many uh, multiple questions. So on behalf of everyone, thank you very much indeed.